dimineață cu această cântare să începem serviciu. Haideți să ne ridicăm în picioare cu nerădare aștept ziua când Isus va veni. față în față. Până atunci, te rog, Doamne, pregătește-ne pe fiecare în parte să ne întâmpinăm pe Tine. Fii cu noi prezent și în această dimineață. Lasă ca Duhul Tău ce Sfânt să cerciteze inimi. Binecuvintează lucrarea, binecuvintează momentul de rugăciune, mesajul la tineret, pe frații misionari, binecuvintează și fă, Doamne, în această duminică o duminică de cer. Amin. Haideți să ocupăm locurile și să când continuăm să ne închinăm în uh, Duh de rugăciune. Salmul 138 spune, Te laud din toată inima, când laudele tale înaintea Dumnezeilor. Mă închin în templul tău ce sfânt și laud numele tău pentru bunătatea și credințășia ta. Următoarea cântare este o rugăciune. Pleacă genunchii, Iisus e aici, ridică mâini curate spre cer. Haideți să cântăm!
întreaga adunare și ca îndemnuri pentru timpul de rugăciune vom citi din psalmul 133. Cuvântul Scripturii mărturisește. Iată ce plăcut și ce dulce este să locuiască frații împreună. Este ca un de lemnul de preț care turnat pe capul lui se pogoară pe barbă, pe barba lui Aron, se pogoară pe marginea veșmintelor lui. Este ca roa Hermonului care se pogoară pe munții Sionului, căci acolo dă Domnul binecuvântarea viața pentru veșnicie. Amin. Vă rog să reocupați locurile. Iubiți frați și surori, pornim în timpul de închinare, în această dimineață și Domnul mi-a pus pe inimă să vă împărtășesc câteva gânduri din psalmul 133, anticipând faptul că vom avea mai mulți frați musafiri și surori în această dimineață și ne rugăm ca Domnul să-i binecuvinteze. Cu adevărat se împlinește cuvântul care spune, iată ce plăcut și ce dulce este să locuiască frații împreună. Avem mai mulți frați musafiri, amintesc că în mod deosebit pe cei pe care i-am anticipat și vor sluji din Cuvântul Sfânt, pe fratele Zec și sora Shenin Knutsen, ei au fost misionari și în Ungaria și vor ține un studiu pentru biserică în această dimineață legat de creșterea copiilor în acord cu Cuvântul Sfânt. De asemenea, ești fratele păstor Doru Gurban, fratele Mihai de la Biserica Apele Vii, o văd și pe sora Negru de la Chicago și dacă sunt și alți frați musafiri și surori, Domnul să vă binecuvinteze. De aceea, dragii mei, haideți să vedem în ce constă această bucurie ca frații să locuiască împreună, urmând ca să venim în rugăciuni de mulțumire înaintea Domnului în prima parte a închinării. Psalmul 133 vorbește despre părtășia frățească și despre elementele care compun această părtășie. Părtășia frățească vine ca să încununeze viața de credință, pentru că nu poți avea părtășie cu cei care nu sunt credincioși. Prin faptul că am venit în această dimineață la închinare și vrem să avem părtășie cu Sfinții, aceasta arată că suntem toți copii a acelui aș Dumnezeu, care e Tatăl nostru, slăvit să fie numele Lui. Părtășia frățească este o caracteristică a Bisericii lui Hristos. El s-a rugat ca noi să fim una. Primul element al părtășiei frățești este unitatea. Ne spune cuvântul, iată ce plăcut și ce dulce este să locuiască frații together, împreună, în unitate. Unitatea dintre noi se realizează prin ceea ce a făcut Dumnezeu în noi. Ne-a călăuzit prin Duhul lui cel Sfânt în tot adevărul, Ioan 17 cu 21. Domnul Isus Hristos a venit ca să ne unească. Această unitate este în credință, este în duc și este în număr. Să nu uitați, lipsa de unitate este dușmanul părtășiei. Și când nu mai e unitate în biserică, frații nu se adună la rugăciune, nu mai zic amin, apar grupulețe, apar tot felul de interpretări. Mă rog ca Domnul să ne ajute să rămânem în unitate, pentru că cuvântul spune, iată ce plăcut și ce dulce este să locuiască frații împreună. Unitatea prin Duhul răspândește tot mai multă unitate, oriunde am fi. Al doilea element al părtășiei frățești este sfințenia. Cuvântul Domnului spune, este ca un deremnul de pres care turnat pe capul lui se pogoară pe barbă, pe barba lui Aron se pogoară pe marginea veșmintelor lui. Unitatea trebuie să continue în sfințenie, unde lemnul aici e simbolul uh, prezenței Duhului Sfânt, a ungerii, a investirii în slujire a Marelui Preot și a împăraților. Această sfințenie este așa cum, nu cum vrem noi, ci sfințenia este, este cerința primordială a lui Dumnezeu, pentru că El spune, fiți sfinți căci eu sunt sfânt. Și cel mai bun exemplu în scurgerea vremurilor și cât vor fi vremurile în sfințenie este Domnul Isus Hristos. Sfințenia este cerința lui Dumnezeu. Și al treilea element din acest salm, care concură la părtășia frățească este binecuvântarea, versetul 3, căci acolo dă Domnul binecuvântarea viața pentru veșnicie. 
dacă nu îndeplinim celelalte condiții, nu îndeplinim condiția unității a Sfințeniei, să nu ne așteptăm la binecuvântări. Binecuvântarea nu e dată în funcție de ziduri, binecuvântarea nu e dată în funcție de bănci, că sunt apițate sau nu. Binecuvântarea este dată de Dumnezeu în măsura în care acceptăm unitatea și sfințenia în viața noastră. Dacă nu împlinim aceste condiții, Dumnezeu nu e gata și nu poate să ne binecuvinteze. Binecuvântarea lui Dumnezeu se rănoiește în fiecare dimineață asupra noastră. Binecuvântarea lui Dumnezeu răspunde nevoilor pe care le avem. Binecuvântarea lui Dumnezeu ne va conduce zi de zi până când vom ajunge acolo în veșnicii, pentru că acolo vom gusta adevărata binecuvântare în prezența lui Isus. Haideți în această dimineață, în prima parte, să-i mulțumim Domnului pentru harul ce ne-l dă de a fi în părtășie frățească, să-i mulțumim pentru unitatea pe care o avem în biserică, să-l rugăm ca El să sfințească viețile noastre și El să ne binecuvinteze. În a doua parte a rugăciunii ne vom ruga pentru sora Mimi, pe ea și de asemenea ne vom ruga pentru familiile bisericii, ca Dumnezeu să le binecuvinteze în acord cu cuvântul care va urma. Mă bucur să-l văd și pe fratele Fil și pe Roxana, soția lui, Fil Brai, ca Domnul să-i binecuvinteze. Eu am mai sunat pe ei, nu i-am sunat pe alții, i-am sunat care de regulă se duc dimineața la frații americani și le-a spus veniți la New Life că se va predica în limba engleză în dimineața aceasta. Și dacă vor veni să-i primim cu toată dragostea. Să ne plecăm pe genunchi, că-i mai duce rugăciunea pe genunchi și să venim în rugăciune de mulțumire înaintea Domnului.
Iată ce plăcut și ce dulce este să locuiască frații împreună. Și am văzut la primele îndemnuri că primul element al părtășiei frățești este unitatea, al doilea element al părtășiei frățești este sfințenia și al treilea element al părtășiei frățești este binecuvântarea, căci acolo dă Domnul binecuvântarea viața pentru veșnicie. În a doua parte a închinării să venim cu cererile și cu mulțumirile noastre, să mulțumim Domnului pentru uh, sora uh, Peia Mimi, pentru care ne-am rugat săptămâna trecută 
și avem toată credința că Dumnezeu va continua să o binecuvinteze. Să mulțumim Domnului pentru frații misionari, pentru fratele Zec și sora Sheini Chinutsen, care vor predica Evanghelia în această dimineață și ne rugăm ca Domnul să-i binecuvinteze. Să mulțumim Domnului pentru frații de la Living Water care ne vizitează și fratele pastor Doru Gurban ne va ajuta la traducere. De asemenea, să mulțumim Domnului că săptămâna viitoare, miercuri, va sosi din România familia fratelui pastor cu tineretul fratele Sami Crișan și sora Irina. Ne rugăm ca Domnul să-i binecuvinteze. De asemenea, să mulțumim Domnului că El se va îngriji ca alegerile din România pentru un nou președinte să fie sub directa lui călăuzire. Citeam zilele acestea o expresie a lui William Penn, cel care a fondat statul Pennsylvania. Poporul care nu este guvernat de Dumnezeu va fi condus de tirani. Noi ne rugăm ca Dumnezeu să conducă România și să credem că voturile vor exprima lucrul acesta. Dacă nu, poporul care nu este guvernat de Dumnezeu va fi condus de tirani. Încă un aspect care m-a întristat, dar nădăjduim ca Dumnezeu să-și reverse îndurarea și peste România, dar și peste America. Curtea Constituțională din România a decis pe 12 noiembrie 2014 că religia nu e obligatorie în școli. Părinții să facă cerere dacă vor oră de religie. Ar trebui să învețe și românii că aici au clactat și americani în urmă cu ani și ani de zile. Când președintele, mi se pare Kennedy, a dispus și a spus că pot americanii să se roage onorabil și acasă și în biserici, dar nu mai e nevoie de școli și am ajuns unde am ajuns. Dumnezeu să se îndure de țara aceasta în care locuim, de România. De asemenea, dragii mei, să mulțumim Domnului pentru harul de a fi împreună păstrați și cultivați părtășia și legătura frățească și dacă observați că cineva lipsește, să aveți pe inimă să-l sunați, să vă rugați și să-l motivați în a rămâne în părtășie cu Dumnezeul Triun. Cu tot ceea ce Dumnezeu vă pune pe inimă, în rugăciuni de cere și de mulțumire, haideți să ne ridicăm în picioare și să țâșnim la rugăciune. Îi îndemn pe tineri să înceapă, se pot ruga și în limba engleză și apoi continuăm cu frați și surori.
ajutorul celor care sunt bolnavi, celor Bine. care sunt închis, care sunt încrințați. Vă rog în special în această dimineață pentru fratele Mihai. Mulțumim pentru cuvântul Tău care te ne învață să trăim în unitate în fața celor din toate. Ajută ne cât atâta de noi să trăim în față de tot. Să dăm dovadă că suntem copiii Tăi. Și ne cuvintează lucrarea ta din ziua aceasta. Și frate de care te vei folosi, bine cuvintează familie, tinere. Și dă ne înțelepciune cum să-ți crească copiii în frică de tine. Pentru toate îți mulțumim în numele Domnului Iisus. Amin. 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 În acestea puțini ani din urmă, Doamne, atât a avansat știința că nu mai aveam timp pentru grijă, Doamne. Doamne, computerile acestea, telefoanele acestea, pur și simplu ne-a luat toată credința. Asta e dovadă că vei veni, Doamne, cu Altceva, te rog în numele Domnului Hristos, Doamne, să trezești bisericile care au venit. Să iubească mai mult cuvântul Tău, Biblia, să iubească, Doamne, părtășia preșească cuvântul Tău și lucrurile acestea toate se desfară din viața noastră. Te rugăm în numele Domnului Hristos să fie rogat. Amin. Rostii rugăciunea ta de Domnul. dragoste unii cu alții. Iată ce dulce și ce plăcut este să locuiască frații împreună. Amin? Amin. Și această, această gălăgie sfântă în casa Domnului, atunci când dăm mâinile unii cu alții, cred că este o indicație a faptului că ne bucurăm să ne vedem fețele și ne bucurăm să fim în casa Domnului. Când am intrat în casa Domnului în această dimineață, printre primele cuvinte care le-am auzit a fost Frate, v-am simțit lipsa duminica trecută. Am, am fost smerit înaintea Domnului și m-am bucurat în același timp că știm să ne spunem atunci când... Și așa să fie Domnul, să ne ajute pe fiecare să simțim lipsa fratelui, a sorei și să sunăm, să ne rugăm și când îi vedem să spunem că ne bucurăm că îi vedem. Amin? Este și aceasta parte din a fi copilul lui Dumnezeu, a fi parte din familia binecuvântată a lui Dumnezeu, înfrățiți prin Domnul Isus Hristos. Vă salutăm în numele Domnului în această dimineață pe toți cei care sunteți în casa Domnului la părtășie cu Domnul și la părtășie unii cu alții. 
și pe cei care sunteți părtași cu noi prin intermediul internetului. Domnul să vă binecuvânteze. Deja frații și surorile au fost amintiți pe nume. Fratele Doru Gurban, fratele Mihai, sora Felicia Negru sunt împreună cu noi și împreună cu noi este și este și Shane și Zach Knutson. Uh, we want to welcome you in our midst, okay, brother Zach, sister Shane, um, and we are open to hear what God has to say to us through you. Um, and we pray that it'll be it'll be extremely beneficial for the church, for the young families, for the older families, for every single one of us. May God give you grace and wisdom. Amen. Aș dori să spunem cu toții versetul care este motoul bisericii și în același timp să ne rugăm ca Domnul să facă o realitate pentru fiecare dintre noi. Căci dacă este cineva în Hristos, este o făptură nouă, cele vechi s-au dus, iată că toate lucrurile s-au făcut noi. Amin. Vă îndemnăm în această dimineață să vă exercitați, să vă exercitați Exercitați datoria de cetățeni ai României, cei care sunteți încă cetățeni români, și să mergeți la vot. Frații care sunt la audiovizual vor pune la sfârșitul, la sfârșitul serviciului divin adresa pentru cei care nu o știți și doriți să mergeți. Și voia Domnului să se facă și în alegerile din România. Amin. După masă, suntem îndemnați să fim în casa Domnului la ora 6, când credem că Dumnezeu ne va vorbi prin fratele Mircea Filip, Domnul să-l binecuvânteze și să continuăm să ne rugăm pentru el. În această dimineață să continuăm să stăm înaintea Domnului în rugăciune, pentru ca Domnul să-l binecuvânteze pe fratele Vali la mesajul pentru tineret. Nu mai este. Uh. Domnul să-l binecuvânteze pe fratele Vali și să-i dea mesaj când va fi la tineret. Continuăm să stăm în duh de rugăciune și Domnul să-i binecuvânteze pe cei, doi, pe cei doi musafiri care vor împărtăși, ne vor împărtăși din cuvântul Domnului și apoi pe fratele Doru Gurban care va traduce mesajul lor. În continuare... Ne închinăm Domnului cu darurile de bunăvoie, timp în care grupul de închinare va trece înainte și ne va conduce în închinare prin cântare de asemenea. Domnul să fie slăvit în toate. Amin. Nu putem fi singuri în lumea asta, de aceea trebuie să luăm cu Isus pe noi, cu noi în fiecare zi. Următoarea cântare spune, cu Isus în lumea asta voi merge tot mereu înainte țara mea, înainte Dumnezeu.
Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. So, forgive me, my phone has notes on it. So, that's why I have it up with me. Good morning. My name is Zach Knudsen. My wife is here. And I'm so excited. We are so blessed to be here with you. Um, we, on the way, he, uh, let me start by saying, I don't know Romanian, but it's okay because I know that when I'm in heaven with you guys, it's going to be a lovely sound. And I love it. We've gotten to go all over the world. And I, I love it when I'm in a place where I don't, I don't know the language. Because I've been around Ukrainian singing, Slovakian singing, you singing, Arabic language. And it's just like, this is what it's like in heaven. I can't wait. And so I, I love it. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to say a few things. My wife will be speaking after me. And I am so, well, I am so blessed to be her husband. She, she was married before. Her, her husband uh, actually passed away three years ago from cancer. And I am, our story is really God's story of redemption. And I can't tell you, I married my best friend. And it's amazing because God didn't intend for him to die. But he has it, he has it all worked out. And so I just want to say that. So anything that Shani shares with you will probably evolve around her life with Peter and their three children, who are now my stepchildren. And I just became a grandfather. And I don't have any children of my own. That's God. So I just wanted to share a few things, uh, a little scripture with you. And before I got here, before yesterday, I was like, God, what do you really want to say to these people? And I really felt like he pressed on my heart, Isaiah 55. And so I was like, okay. And I, I had to look it up, like, what does it say? And I was talking to Shani on the way here this morning, and she was like, well, I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's really what I, all last night I kept hearing Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55. So I just want to say that, so you know that this is really, I don't feel like it's just my thoughts. So it's for you. And this morning, the, luckily I had someone translating for me. But it just sounds like everyone is hungry for unity. Everyone is hungry for more. And I love that. Because we're all about Jesus, right? And Jesus has so much more for us. And no matter where you're at in your life, and whether it's the beginning you just met Jesus, or you've been with him for 70 years, it doesn't matter. He's, he's so amazing. And there's so much. Forgive me. There's so much. So... I just wanted to share Isaiah 55 with you a little bit. And I don't know if it'll be up there. I didn't say anything about that. But it starts by saying, well, really, it's an invitation. It is an invitation to know the goodness and the kindness of God. And I know, it, it, sometimes people say, I know God is good, but, and they give a reason. You know that you've probably said it yourself. I've said it in my life. I, I know God is good, but there's no way this is going to work out. I've been praying for this person for 30 years, but I don't really know that they'll ever come to know God. And to me, that is just, that is, that's really a lie from hell. That is not the truth of God. And, and so I love it that because in this room we have people who are young and old, and it doesn't matter because we're all beautiful. We're all made in his image. And I love that. And the moment I look at someone else through that filter of, whoa, they are made in God's image. Anything that is negative, I have to throw it out. I have to throw it out because that is not from my father. And so it starts by saying, come. All who are thirsty, come to the waters. Who is it talking to? All. And it gives no indication of race, language they speak, where they come from, what their circumstances. All. And I love that. 
all, come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, buy, buy and eat. Which is kind of funny. So, you don't have money, but come and buy. And that's because Jesus already paid for it. So you get, you have it. And you can, you can buy. And come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And wine is of celebration. Milk is of the promised land. And I love it. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Everlasting is permanent, forever. I will make a covenant with you that does not break. Those are my words. Does not break. My faithful love promised to David. So that covenant that was promised to David will be yours. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will know. I'm not going to read it all, by the way. Surely you will summon nations you know not. And nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endured, or excuse me, for he has endowed you with splendor. He has given you splendor, joy, life. Seek the Lord with, while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Our God will free pardon means to forgive. You may have done something. Go, you're free. Some people get upset when someone who has committed a crime gets pardoned. And they get out of jail. They may have done terrible things. And you're like, that is not justice. I'm like, well... It says right here, let him pardon us. Because whoever that is, they were made in his image. What they may be doing is wrong. But who they are is incredible. And I, I'm getting towards the end here. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And I... I just want to stay on that for a second. For your thoughts are not my thoughts. Let me say that again. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Have you ever stopped to really ponder that? Have you ever thought something that you felt was right, and then you really felt like God put it on your heart, and you're like, whoa, I was wrong. And I want to say that, and I pray today would be the beginning of something new for this house, this church. I loved getting to kneel. I, where I come from, I, I don't go to a church that kneels. And, and I just loved it because especially when I don't know what's really being said, all I hear is the heart. And I love that because I can hear mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, in the midst of everyone, saying out to God, speaking out to their Father. And I love that. And I just want to say that I feel like something amazing is going to happen in this house because of your heart. And the, just the little bit of adjusting that God wants to do in your heart and in your lives and in the way you think. Because the truth is, if we don't think with the mind of Christ, we are actually thinking of what is the opposite of Christ? Really, it's the opposite of Christ. The Antichrist. You know, people think that it's a person, but really it's a belief system. You know? I want to have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. And that's transforming. Because your little, your little brother, your little sister, who may be little, or maybe you're both adults, you might be really hurt by them. But you need to have the mind of Christ towards them. And you know what? They may have done things to you. Your mother, your father may have done things to you in your life that were not right. 
they may have just been doing the best they knew how, right? <laughs> I know my mom, my dad, they hurt me, um, and they were so sweet, but it just happens. But the truth is, I need to have the mind of Christ towards them. I need to at least bring my heart to a place that says, okay, God, do something with this. I know that this is not the mind of Christ. This is not of my Father. And let him totally change your life. And maybe that sounds really simple, and it's beautiful because it is. Sometimes things take several years. But I want you to, I want to suggest to you that maybe you should keep your thoughts in this place of, God, I know you can do it right now. Not 10 years. That's, that may be what happens. But if I'm thinking 10 years, it's probably going to take 10 years. If I'm thinking right now, why not? And it could. God can change your life. He can adjust your heart. He can do whatever he wants. He's God. He brought me my wife. She and her whole family that lived in Denmark. I was in Indiana, and I moved to 20 minutes away to a new community because I met people who were like, I don't, I don't get these, these Christians, but what they have I want because they were the realest, sweetest, most amazing Christians that I ever met, coolest people I knew. And I was like, I got to go, and I did. God provided me an apartment right below theirs, these two friends I met. Well, it's that same friend that brought me 20 minutes away that was a connecting point that brought Shani and her whole family from Denmark. When my friends moved out of the apartment, I was really sad. But guess who moved in? Shani and her daughter. And we have a wild story that takes more than an hour to tell you of amazing things that God has done. And I, I just want to stop here and say, let's just raise our faith a bit. Whatever it is, wherever it's at, just raise it up. Just say, I take the lid off, God. Whatever you want to do, because I'm telling you, my life, see, the thing about testimony is it means so that it may happen again. And that I could tell you testimonies and testimonies and testimonies that might even make you uncomfortable, but they're my testimonies because I've seen God move. I've seen God do things, and I love it because they're mine, and I want those same things for you because they will change your life. And they will change your friend's life. They will change your best friend's life that you've been praying for for 30 years. So I will stop. So I'm, we are so blessed to be here with you. And I pray that God would speak to you through Shaney. Um, and I pray that he's, he's spoken to you here. Because I am so blessed to be here. And I love the sound. The Romanian language. It's so beautiful. I love it. I don't even know it. It doesn't matter. It's beautiful. And you're beautiful. So, at that I stop. So, thank you very much. Înainte ca sora să împărtisească mesajul cu noi, aș dori să cântăm o cântare, o cântare nouă, poate pentru biserică sau poate pentru unii. O să cântăm și dimineața și după masă ca să învățați. Este cântare cântată de fratele de la Oșova care nu are mâini, Sergiu Nichescu. Și cântarea spune așa frumoasă, spune ce mare ești tu, Doamne, ce mare ești și sfânt. Spun soarele și luna și vuietul de vânt și trăzne tot ce culcă stejarii la pământ și vuietul furtunii și al păsărilor când. Este cântare și frumoasă. Haideți să învățăm această dimineață.
morning. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I lived in Europe for, I guess, 20 years in total, in Denmark and Scotland, and 10 years in Hungary. And uh, I traveled all over the region of, well, all over Europe, but all over Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia, worked all over um, working with children, youth, and families. And um, so I love being in this environment because I feel like I'm at home, you know? Um, it's really a pleasure. And I've enjoyed um, this whole last weekend just being with so many amazing Romanians. It's just fun. And I love, I love the nation of Romania. Been there many times and um, have many friends from Romania. Mihai I've known since 1997. Yeah. So, um, so thank you for having us here. Um, before I really get into what I want to say, um, well, I'm going to say what I want to say all the way, but um, before I get into really um, sharing with you what, what um, I came to share, I have to share with you something that the Lord told me to share. <laughs> and um, actually, two nights ago, um, it was four o'clock in the morning, uh, the Lord woke me up. and he said that he wanted to talk to me about this body, um, this, this congregation. And um, we didn't know at the time that I was going to be standing here sharing with you for an hour <laughs> today. <laughs> but the Lord started speaking to me. And, um, and I, just, I just had this picture of this congregation. And I said, Lord, what, what do you want to say? What is, your, what is your heart for this congregation? And the first thing he said to me was, I want you to honor. I want you to show honor. And he, I, he said, particularly to those who, um, went, who lived in Romania under communism as believers. And I would like to ask if those of you that lived in Romania under, commu under communism as a believer would stand up. I honor you. I honor you for what you for what you did. I honor you for who you are. You can keep standing. If keep standing because I want I want you to be seen and I want you to truly hear what the Lord wants to say. Keep standing. Just keep standing. Okay. I heard the Lord say to me, to say to you, thank you. Thank you for persevering. Thank you for standing firm. Thank you for holding on to faith when it was hard. And I want those of you who are sitting to look these people went through things that you, at this point in your life, cannot understand. Even if you've heard the stories, you can't understand it because you weren't there. And that's okay. But you need to understand these people have something to give you. They have something to share with you. And for those of you standing, the Lord said this to me. Your time is not finished. You have so much to give. And what you have to give is what you have to give is understanding of what it means to walk with God. What it means is that you have you have understanding of what it means to persevere. And this generation needs to know, they need to hear, they need to understand. Because God is going to take them into things where they're going to need 
to hear from you your testimonies, not your, not your thoughts about what they should do. Because what they are going to do is going to be different from what you did. But what they, what they have to understand is how to stand in their heart as you did. So you aren't finished. You have a responsibility to this generation. But understand that they are moving into something that is different. They're facing things that are far beyond anything that you had to face, but in a different way. They're so different. And yet, they are going to go into some things that are very, very difficult, just as you did, but it doesn't look the same. So know that you have so much to give. You, you are a treasure. You are a treasure to the next generation. Do you hear that? Young people in this church, do you hear? These people are actually treasures for you that God has planted in this place to give you some, some nuggets of truth to carry with you that you will have to work out in your life. You will have to work out in your heart for yourself. But if you will listen to the testimonies, it will give you courage and strength to walk forward. You're welcome to sit down. Then, after the Lord gave me this word for you, he actually showed me the faces of two women. And when I walked in and I met Daniela, one of it, your face was one of those faces, and I kept seeing it very clearly. And when I walked in here, I went, oh, that's, there she is. And the Lord said, I want you to tell her I've heard her heart cry. And I want you to tell her thank you for your faithfulness. You have been very faithful even when you felt like no one saw and no one heard and no one knew. And he is so, you are so highly favored by God. You are a treasure. You are a gift. And, and he is so pleased with you. And so he said to share that with you. And then I met Maria. Maria, the Lord said to me, I want you to tell her she is famous in heaven. Heaven knows you. Heaven sees you. When you pray, the heavens gather around and they listen and they cheer you on. And there are people in heaven today because of you and because of your prayers. And there are people who will be in heaven for all of eternity because of you, because of your prayers. You are famous in heaven. You know, in, we have armies, and in the armies we have generals. You are a general. You are a general in his army because you have stood faithful and you have prayed and you have fought. You have fought battles that not one person in this room knows about. But he knows and he sees. He's so pleased with you. You are, you are a treasure and a gift. You have much to give. You have so much to give. This woman has so much to give you. She has so much wisdom. Yeah. And I just, I just, I, I saw it when I walked in and I saw your face again. It was like, yep, there she is. That's the face. That's the face I saw. Yeah. Hmm. You know, 2 Corinthians, sorry, I need to put my glasses on. I can't see anything. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're all going from glory to glory. Did you know that? Did you know it? Do you know it in your head or do you know it in your heart? Do you know that 
you don't have to go from glory to glory, that you can just stay in the old glory. Did you know that? You can, you can decide that, well, this is good enough. This is, this is where, this is, this is the life. Or you can actually go from glory to glory, being transformed, being made even more in his likeness. You know, you don't have to be. It's a choice. Because God will not cross your will. It's about surrender. Are you, are you willing to surrender? Am I willing to surrender to, in order to go to a whole nother level of the glory of God, to receive a whole new revelation. See, that's the point. It's a new revelation. It's a new thing. I can stay in the old glory, or I can move into the new glory. You know, God has so much for us. The Bible says, he who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond, all that we ask or imagine. Hello. Let me say it again. To him who is able to do exceedingly, that's huge, abundantly, that's a lot, above and beyond what you even ask or imagine. To him be the glory. I want to know that God. I want, if he's able to give me more than I can imagine, more of his glory, <laughs> I'm going after it. I want it. I am so willing to let it all go. I don't want to hold on to stuff in my life. I want to let go. I want to say, God, I want to be willing to say, God, I actually recognize that that, that belief system that I have is wrong. And it's keeping me from you. You can have it. <laughs> I'm letting go because I want the more of God. We've been talking about human development this whole last weekend, which is about the stages of our development from conception up to 18 uh, years and how it affects us for the rest of our life if it's good and if it's bad. And... So, you know, I, I've discovered, I've been teaching this for 23 years, I think. I've been teaching this subject for 23 years. I've traveled to over 70 countries. I've observed children in every walk of life that you can imagine. And we all follow the same process. But we also, because of the process and because of things that can be done wrong within the process, we all have the ability to actually get stuck, to get stuck in a stage, to get stuck in a, in a belief system because of something that happened at a certain age in our life. And that, that belief system becomes a filter that we look through. We are all created in the image of God. And it says in Genesis, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created man and woman to come together as one to be a reflection of him to his, their children. But what happens when we're wounded and we, and we are looking through a filter at God we don't see him clearly, and we reflect a distorted image of God to our children, and it perpetuates itself from generation to generation to generation. And so what, what, what I desire is through human development to actually begin to see where those filters are and to start removing them so that we can truly be a reflection more and more of the image of God, that we can go from the glory that we're in to a higher level of glory, to a higher level of glory, because we become more and more whole, more and more uh, free from lies that we've believed.
I want to address um, just a few things that we have, um, scripture that we have uh, used in the body of Christ that we have misinterpreted because we haven't understood um, the original translation or the culture that it was written in. The first one is Proverbs 22, 6. It says, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This, this has generally been believed that you have to, you know, I'm teaching you about God, and I'm telling you what to do, and I'm going to raise you up to be who I think you should be. Yeah? That's pretty... Does that sound kind of accurate about what that scripture means? Yeah. If you look at the, if you go back to the Hebrew and you translate it directly from Hebrew, it actually says this. Raise up a child according to the way that he bends. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does this mean? It means that I need to recognize who my child is. I actually need to get to know my child in a way that I can say, wow, they really bend this way. They are really, you know, some kids are really, they're really focused and they're, they just keep going and, and it doesn't matter what you say, they're like, they just keep on going and we say, you're rebellious. They're not. They can become rebellious. But that's not, that's not who God made them to be. But he did make them to be focused. He did make them to be strong. He did make them to be leaders. My job is not to break that. My job is to guide that. My, go my job is to raise them up with those strengths intact, but in the proper way. Yes, you are, I see that you you know, you, when you see something, you just go. But you also have to be able to, while you're going, listen. Because there may be a warning. There may be something saying, stop for a moment. There may, you, do, is this making sense to you? Okay. Raise them up according to the way that they bend. Know your child. Know your grandchildren. Know the children that you are around. And instead of putting your ideas on them, get God's heart for them. And raise them in that direction. How awesome would, would it be? Many young people are pushed into things by parents. And they hate that direction. Because it's not who they are. If we could recognize who our children are and send them in the direction that they bend, how much happier will they be? How much more effective will, there be, will they be? So many people go through life frustrated, disillusioned, and discouraged because they're doing things and they're moving in a direction that's based on finances. Well, don't, don't become a fireman because, you know, that doesn't make money. Become a lawyer. Yes, but he doesn't have the mind of a lawyer, and that will be torture for him. But he's doing it because that's what he was told to do. But if he was a fireman, he would thrive because it was what he was made for. When our children have dreams, and desires and longings, do you encourage that or do you discourage it? Do you want to encourage them to move into, to become all that they can be? Do you know you can't spoil a child as a baby? You can't spoil a child until two. And from there, um, they, don't, they don't need, they do need discipline, but they don't need harsh discipline. They need guidance. Which brings me to another scripture. Proverbs 13, 24 says, 
He who, spare, he who spares the rod spoils the child or ruins the child. Again, this is a passage that has been heavily misunderstood. It's been used to beat children. It's been used to, um, and, and with, hear this, very often with good intentions. It's not because our intentions are bad, but we have not understood scripture. And so we have taken something and we, we beat kids because we want them to do what is right. We want them to understand. But do you understand the purpose of the rod? You see, the purpose of the rod, the shepherd had a rod, and he would use the rod to guide the sheep. It was a tool for guidance, not for beating. And sometimes he might tap the sheep if they were really going off in the wrong direction. He would tap them to bring them back. But because he, he, the sheep knew his no, the sheep knew his voice. The sheep always know their shepherd's voice. And the shepherd doesn't have to be harsh with the sheep. He is kind. Because do you know, it's such a beautiful picture, the shepherd and the sheep. You know, it says uh, in Romans 2, 4, it's the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. It's, that, it's the kindness, not the harshness. And Psalm, the 23rd Psalm says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Let me ask you a question. Does this seem comforting to you? <laughs> Does this? No, let me show you. Does that seem comforting to you? Yeah, it does to me to be guided, to be shown the way, to be in relationship, to know the kindness of God, to know the kindness of my parents, to know their voice because we're in relationship, and to be guided and to be led. That's, that's the beauty of relationship with God, and that's the beauty of parenting. It is the, the getting to show kindness and love to our children. And yes, sometimes we have to be firm. And sometimes God is firm with us. But he's not harsh. We may think he's harsh because our parents were harsh with us. And they reflected an image that was distorted of who he is. But the truth is God is so kind. He is so good. It's... God is good and nothing bad comes from him. Nothing. He is so good. How can bad come from good? It's not possible. I, I forgot to look at what time I started. <laughs> How long? About five more minutes? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is this making sense to you? Yeah? Okay. God is so loving. He is so good. You know, um, Zach told you that I was married before to Peter. We were married for 23 years. He died one month after our 23rd anniversary. And... Um, he, he was sick uh, for five years. He had cancer. He had a very rare cancer where he would actually um, scratch the skin off of his body. It was very awful, actually. And um, you know what he would always say? He would say, God is so good. It doesn't matter because God is so good. And he's so faithful. And whether I'm healed now or I'm healed in eternity, I know it's not his will for me to be sick. We live in a fallen world and we're battling to take ground. We're taking back what the enemy has stolen. And sometimes when a seed, a seed has to fall to the ground, 
in order to and die in order to bear fruit. But that's but it is not the heart of God for us to be sick. And he would say, I know God did not give me the sickness. I know it. And he, he would say, I refuse to build a case against God for the bad things that are happening in my life. Do you know he prayed for people who got healed? And he didn't. What do you do with that? He chose, and he would say every day until the day he died, God is good, and I will not build a case against God. Because anything that is happening to my body right now is not from him and never can be. Because good does not give bad. Life is not giving death. I came to give life in abundance. That is what Jesus said. I came to give life in abundance. And he wasn't actually talking about um, life in eternity. He was talking about life on earth. I came that you might have life and have life in abundance. And so Peter's testimony was to the end. God is good. Nothing bad comes from him. Never build a case against him. Never let negative things come out of your mouth toward God. And in any situation, you can be honest. This is what's going on. Look, read the Psalms. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Where are you, God? Why are you not here? You know, the psalmists pour out their heart. David pours out his heart. This is how I feel. But this is how it ends. But God... You are faithful. You are an ever-present help in times of trouble. You are good. You are holy. You are righteous. Who can stand in your presence? You are awesome. But God. There should be no buts about it but God. No matter what bad thing is happening in your life. But God. But God. Always. But God. Not God is good but Flip it. This is happening. But God. But God is so faithful. And I stand on that. But see, it's one thing to say. It's another thing to do. Right? Because we have these belief systems in our heads for some reason that we don't understand which I will talk about after we have a break. <laughs> Is that okay? Okay. Ce cântare mai potrivită putem să cântăm după mesajul sorei decât mă încred în el, orice s-ar întâmpla? Pe drumul meu sau în viața mea, fie ce-o fi în orice zi, ceresc cu Tatăl Macalozii. Haideți pentru dezamorțire, haideți să ne ridicăm în picioare.
So I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about about thoughts, about belief systems, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna share some scientific evidence of uh, regarding thoughts and belief systems, and then I'm gonna talk about how um, certain things get established in our lives. Um, so. There's a doctor, her name is Dr. Caroline Leaf, and she's a South African scientist who's been studying, she's a Christian, who's been studying the brain for over 30 years. And they have discovered some incredible things about the brain. It's really interesting. That they've discovered that thoughts are not abstract, but thoughts and beliefs are actually physical. They're a physical thing in your brain. And what they, what they discovered was that every thought that becomes into your brain passes through the area of the brain that they now know to be free will. And it's interesting, she says this, we have discovered that free will is the most powerful area of the body. I don't understand it all, she's the scientist. <laughs> but she said, we know it's so powerful and every single, every single thing that comes into your brain has to pass through your will. She said, if when it's passing through free will, you reject it, it goes poof and it disintegrates into the body. But if it passes through your will and you accept this thought or belief, it actually sets itself up physically in your brain. You have, they look like trees. She said you have forests of trees in your brain that are physical. And she said every thought, every thought develops on it either what appear to be leaves or what appear to be thorns. The leaves are what develop on positive, good, healthy thoughts and beliefs, and thorns are what develop on negative, unhealthy beliefs and thoughts. And the thorns and the leaves both give off chemicals into your body. The leaves give off chemicals that are good and actually help your body to be healthy. The thorns give off chemicals that go into your body and make you sick. And they've actually discovered, they believe that 80 to 85% of all sickness is rooted in our thoughts and the chemicals being released into our body. Yes, there are outside influences that feed it, but the root is in our thoughts. It brings a whole new meaning to when the Bible says, take every thought captive. It is for that reason that we have to say, but God, but God. This may be what's happening, but God. You see, what you do is you take, you take a negative that's happening in your life, and you say, yeah, here's the negative, I see it. I get it, let's talk about reality. Okay, let's talk about reality. This is what's happening. It's not good. But we take God and we superimpose his truth over reality. And it has to go. Because I take, I take this belief system, I take this, this this belief that I have about what's happening, and I say, but God is faithful. Therefore, I stand firm on truth. You're taking your beliefs, you're taking your thoughts captive. You're saying, I will not submit to negativity. I will not submit to this, to this evil that is trying to set itself up in my brain. Now, they've also discovered that children from conception to two years old have brain waves that function on the theta uh, wavelength. And what that, 
is like, is, is, it's like a, an adult who is in deep sleep. What it means is that their brain is not functioning at a level that they can filter what happens to them. Therefore, everything that happens to them goes straight into their brain and sets itself up as truth. So if something bad is happening, even if it's not happening to them, but they're seeing it or they're feeling it because someone else is having a bad experience. Maybe mom is having a breakdown and she's crying and, it's, and, and, and life is really hard for mom all the time. And the child sees that. What happens, the child, the only thing they can do is receive this as being about me. And they'll take on a belief it can be something along the lines of, I am not wanted. I am not worthy. I am, there's something wrong with me. It's not a thought. It's a, it's, a, it's a concept that sets itself up in their brain. And it goes in, and because of the way that their brave way, brain waves are functioning, it sets itself up in the subconscious, not the conscious brain. With children from the age of two to six, their brain waves function on a level known as the delta level. This is the same level as a person who has been hypnotized. And it's, it's the exact same effect. Whatever happens to them or around them, if it's a negative, it goes in and it sets itself up in, it, in their brain as a negative belief about themselves. Not about you, about themselves because they don't have a filter to be able to filter out, this isn't about me, this is about them. We can do that, but children up until around the age of six don't have that ability. So many people struggle with things. Many people, they know that God loves them, but they struggle to believe it for themselves, to really believe it. They know it here, but they don't know it here, because there's something in the subconscious telling them you're not worthy to be loved. And they can't get to it. You only get there by allowing the Holy Spirit to show you and to bring freedom. But you can, when you have a negative thought, and this is what they discovered. They discovered that when you have a negative thought, you can actually cause the thorns to become leaves in three days, if you stand firm on the truth. Very interesting. Stand firm on truth. It's not about whether you feel it. It's about whether you choose it. So you choose truth. I am not, I don't feel worthy to be loved. But I begin to say, I am worthy to be loved. I am worthy to be loved. Whenever that thought comes, not I, you know, I don't deserve love. I'm worthy to be loved. I stand on it. The, the, le the thorns become leaves. And in 21 days, when I maintain this belief, I maintain it, I maintain it, it can actually, it's actually then burned onto the brain and made solid, made solidified. And... And so I say all this to, so that we understand that a lot of times the struggles that we go through in life, they're actually, you know, we can beat ourselves up about it and be so hard on ourselves or on other people, not realizing there's, there are reasons that we feel the way we do. There are reasons we have belief systems that don't line up with the Bible, and we need to have compassion toward ourselves and towards each other and give grace so that we can change. Do you know that a person will change much faster if you actually speak the truth of who God says they are as opposed to what you're seeing them do right now? Well, you're so this, you're so that, you always do this. Why do you always do this? This is such a problem. If you would just change, how do you feel when someone does that to you? <laughs> I know how I feel. I just bring, it heaps shame on me. But man, people, when people say positive things to me, even if I'm feeling negative about myself, 
I might heap shame on myself for a while, but if they keep saying it pretty soon, I'm actually maybe going to start believing this. And pretty soon, I'm actually going to know it. And pretty soon, I'm going to be walking in my true identity in Christ. Because I am a new creation. I just, sometimes our bodies and our souls haven't lined up with it. You see, when you get saved, your spirit is saved for eternity. It's done. But actually, the Bible says we are to, we are to work out our salvation. That has to do with the soul. We have to take our thoughts captive. We have to shift our mindsets. And we have to bring, we have to tell our soul. David speaks to his soul. Oh, my soul, why are you downcast? Rise up. Get in line. Our, our spirit is alive in Christ. We, but we have responsibility because our soul is connected to our will. And so I have to tell my soul, get in line with my spirit. And I have to live from the spirit, not from the soul. Doesn't matter what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. I can be honest about it, but I still need to say, okay, I feel really miserable right now. I really hate the way I'm feeling or I'm, I'm angry right now or whatever. But soul, get in line with the spirit because this is who you are. This is who you were made to be. You're better than this. I'm better than this. I'm better than my behavior because I've been made righteous. And so I bring my soul into alignment. So I want to talk to you now about the different stages, and I cannot, in the time we have, possibly give you a full picture. <laughs> but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each stage, and I'm going to pull one thing out from each stage that is an important value for that stage and what it can look like when things are done well and what it can look like when things are not done well. So for example, when we are in the womb, it is at that point that our foundation for whether or not we are worthy is be to be loved is being established. If the child feels in any way, a sense of rejection, then belief systems form in their mind that say, you're not worthy, you're not worthy, I'm not worthy. Even if they're wanted, but mom's going through something really, really bad, her mother dies, or you know, there's, there's been a, a severe car accident and dad is, is, is laying in the hospital and she doesn't know what's gonna happen and she's in distress. The child feels that and has no filter, so therefore it has to be about me. Therefore, I am not worthy. And that's actually a belief system that can get set up in their brain. And so they can actually go through life struggling to believe whether or not they are worthy. But if mom's in a, in a, a protected, healthy environment, mom's happy, she's excited, she's you know speaking life over the child, that child the foundation for whether or not they're worthy to be loved is established. I am worthy to be loved. This is a good thing. It is good to live. Make sense to you? Okay. If at any time something has gone wrong and belief systems have been set up, as parents, we have the right and the authority to pray over our children and to break those things off of them. And so that's, I don't want you, to, if you feel like, oh my goodness, I made some big mistakes here or my kid is ruined forever or, <laughs> you know, no, they're not. God is so much bigger than that. He is the God who heals. Okay, so, so I'm telling you this to understand the process, but I'm not telling you this so that you come under condemnation. All right? or so that you will condemn your parents or somebody else. <laughs> In the next stage, it is the next building block. So now we know that we're worthy to be loved. The next step is about trust. From zero to six months, the, one of the primary things that that child is learning is I can trust. 
And it's the foundation for them to be able to trust God and to have faith because they trust him. If we don't have trust, we will struggle to have faith. So when the child is born, their job, their only job, is to receive. And it is where they are beginning to recognize their needs. They feel hungry. They let you know. They cry. You feed them. Their needs get met. And you know what they're learning? I can trust. If we don't feed them when they're hungry, you know what happens? They learn, my needs will not be met. I cannot trust. And right there at the beginning of life, we break their trust. Not on purpose. We think we're doing the right thing, but we haven't understood that there are foundations being laid through the simple everyday things of being hungry and being fed when you're hungry. And that's just one example of how trust is being laid. If, if mom and dad are really good at, at recognizing the needs of their child and the child cries and they know the baby's hungry and they feed the baby and they're holding the baby and they're loving the baby, that child has such trust established in them. I look at my own life. You know, I had so many things come against me in life. I was um, abused. I was abused sexually, physically, emotionally, psychologically. I, um, my parents divorced. My mom was married to a crazy man who wanted to kill us. Um, you know, th things happened in life through my childhood that were really negative. But here's the interesting thing. And God has healed me from all that, and it's amazing. I'm an amazing testimony. But here's the incredible thing. I always thought it's so interesting that with all these negative things that have happened to me, I don't have a problem really trusting people. But I talked with my mom about it and found out how she raised me in those first months. She, she did it all right. She did it all well. And so I have a foundation of trust in my life that was established from birth. It's biblical, and I, I didn't bring my, my um, notes up with where it is in Scripture, but uh, in Psalms, somewhere in Psalms, it says, it talks about how, um, about God knowing me from birth and that I learned to trust you at my mother's breast. That, that we learn to trust from that early stage as we receive what we need from our parents, okay? The next stage is from six months to 24 months. In this stage, this stage we call exploration. This is where the child is exploring everything. Everything is new to the child. And they're taking in information. They're finding out what's hard, you know, what hurts when I run into it. And what, what is soft and what, is, what things taste like. Everything is new. Everything. They need to explore. It's a time in their life where what is being established through exploration is motivation, initiative, and creativity. Those three key things for their life, now that they trust, they can move into moving towards the things that motivate them, taking initiative. At the stage six to, to 24 months, it's all about me, and that's okay. It's actually not time to discipline them because they have a God-given deep need to move around and touch everything and explore everything. So my job is to move everything that they shouldn't be touching out of the way. It's what we call house 
baby-proofing the house, not house-proofing the baby. Okay, baby doesn't need to learn. Don't touch this. Don't touch. If everything you say to the child, no, 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 and you're slapping their hand and you're moving them away, and no, 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 you know what that child is going to ha- what's going to happen to that child? They're going to stop taking initiative. They're going to lose motivation, and it's going to stifle their creativity. Because they're in a stage right now where they have to discover. It's actually a God-given need for them. And and what they're learning is that, that through the motivation to go, to look, to touch, that they can take initiative, that they can learn. And it's the beginning of them developing creativity because they're discovering new things. We learn, we, we develop creativity as we get out there and we discover. What will that do in our relationship with God? If, if, our, if our initiative and our motivation, our creativity is stifled, we, we, we end up going into a, basically a box and saying, I can only do this. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't think that I can do that. And it actually hinders our ability to, again, walk by faith. Because how can, in order to walk by faith, you have to be able to take initiative. You have to step out. You have to step off the cliff. Faith is stepping off the cliff. Well, I'm not really motivated to step off the cliff. <laughs> Because I didn't learn that to be motivated and to take initiative. Faith comes, faith begins to grow as we learn to be creative. You have to be creative to believe that something that you can't see is going to happen. Right? The next stage of development is the three, no, the two-year-old stage. This stage, you know what one of the biggest issues for this stage is? It's anger. Does that sound familiar to? Two and anger. Oh, yeah, that's right. (laughs) Two-year-olds can be really angry. Sometimes parents will say to me, I don't know what happened to my sweet baby. All of a sudden, they're angry, and all they can say is no. They're very negative. Well, actually, the truth is, they're not actually being negative. They're actually trying to separate themselves to become an individual. And that's how they, that's the only way that they know is to go, no, no, do you want ice cream? No. And then they cry because they really want ice cream. And so uh, they get, they have anger issues because. They need to learn from me how to behave when they're angry. That's what's being established. How to behave when they're angry. So they watch, they watch mom and dad to see how mom and dad behave when they're angry, and then they will mimic it. Oh, that hurts. Because sometimes we get really mad and we don't control ourselves. Because we also weren't taught when we were two. And our parents probably also weren't taught when they were two. And it's this perpetual cycle of a lot of angry people in our family. And and but when but when we understand that that's the issue, it helps. Half of your healing is simply understanding. You still have to make some decisions. You still have to, you know, make some good choices. You still have to seek God for healing. But half the healing comes through simply understanding. Oh, that's the problem. That's where it comes from. A lot of us struggle with anger and don't know what to do with it. And we, it's, it's sad because whether it's anger or any other issue in, in, in our lives, you, you can really come under a lot of shame and condemnation because 
when we have, for example, anger in our life that's really strong and we don't know how to control it, we do things that hurt other people. And it just heaps shame on us. We just feel so shamed. And either, either we become rigid and harsh or we just come under it and become overwhelmed and, and, um, and upset with ourselves. And what we need to know is that anger does not have to be, doesn't have to be sin. <laughs> anger is sim- all of your emotions. They're gauges. Think of it as a gauge that's telling you where you're at. Okay? If you think of it that way, it can be easier to deal with it. Okay, I'm angry. I'm really angry. (laughs) It's a gauge. Something is going on in me. Maybe someone is doing something, but the issue is not them. It's me. Most people's anger goes far beyond what the actual situation would require in reality. But something's being triggered, and I haven't learned what to do with my anger, and so I hurt people. Let me give you some really fast, easy tips on how to deal with anger. Number one, don't hurt yourself. Okay, And by that, I mean obviously physically, don't hurt yourself. But emotionally, don't hurt yourself. Quit beating yourself up. Quit walking around and telling yourself how stupid you are. You know that's sin? Because God looks at you and he says, I do not say that you are stupid. I say that you are beautifully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a treasure to me. You are my gift. You are my gift to this world. You have come from my heart. That's what he says. So anytime I say something about myself that is contrary to what he says about me, it's wrong. It doesn't mean I'm not honest. But the honest thing is, I'm really angry. Or I really don't like that I did that. But the dishonest thing is, I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. I hate myself. Da-da-da. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt others. Obviously, don't physically hurt them. We do that, that's sin. It's what you do with your anger that is sin, that can be sin. Don't hurt them physically. But also, don't hurt them with your words. Don't say negative things to them. Don't call them names. Don't even say things that you think are right if it's not love that is coming out of your mouth. But also, don't withhold your love, affection, or communication from them because you're angry at them. That's called being passive-aggressive. Passive, being passive-aggressive is as damaging as speaking negative words because they feel rejected. So don't withhold your words. But you also need to have some uh, guidelines within the family, within your community, for what to do when you get angry. Because there is energy in anger, and you need to do something, or you're going, you know, your head's going to explode. So, you have an agreement. When I'm angry, I am free to say, I am too angry to talk to you right now. I need to go. And you get the energy out. You get the anger out. And you go for a run, go for a walk, clean your house, you know, uh, scream into a pillow, whatever you have to do, Get it out. But then, sit yourself down and say, Lord, show me. Why am I so angry about this? What's the real issue? What really happened to trigger me when this happens? Maybe maybe someone says to you that, um, that you look ridiculous in, in that hat. And you're like, You get so angry, like, how could you say that to me? That is so rude. I can't believe you said, and you're so angry, and you go and you talk to the Lord about it because, first of all, it doesn't matter. (laughs) And second, just because they, they said that, it doesn't mean that I have to be so angry. But Lord, why was I triggered so badly? Well, because the Lord may show you, when you were three, you were playing, and you put on clothes, you know, your, your, 
your big sister's clothes. And your big brother came in and said, oh, you look so stupid in those clothes. Or, you know, and you felt humiliated. And so now, when someone says something to you along those lines, it triggers you and you get angry. Okay? So there, you're angry, but often it's beyond what the situation requires because you're being triggered. Okay? So if at two we don't learn how to deal with our anger, then then we will go for the rest of our life struggling with anger issues. Does that make sense? Is this making sense to you? Yeah? Okay. But if we're shown, when I, when I do something as a two-year-old that makes mom, that where mom gets really angry, if mom controls herself, and, and she can say, I am very angry right now. I am not happy about what you did, and you're going to have to learn that you can't do that. And she begins to discipline the child in a way that causes the child to learn to think for themselves. She's showing them, just because I'm angry, I don't have to hurt you. I don't have to blow up. Okay? And quickly, I just want to say, if you follow the same pattern, if it's done well, it comes out well. If it's done not well, then you will struggle. From three to six years old, a big issue is identity. Um, identity and being right and being wrong. Legalism. Legalism, if, peop if you know someone who's very legalistic, black and white, this is how it is, they're probably wounded from the three to six year old stage. If you know somebody who struggles with homosexuality or their identity as a man or a woman, it probably comes from the three to six year old stage. And if they tell you, I've always felt this way, they probably have, because it, they were, their, 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 their um, sex role identity would, was hurt in some way between three and six years old. From six to 12 years old, you're dealing with um, developing skills and developing your own, uh, further developing your identity and what you are capable of. Learning, I'm capable. And this is where they try all kinds of things and they want to learn things. The key in this stage is to teach them to start, follow through, and finish something. Because a lot of people start things but they never finish because at this age they weren't required to finish. They just, it fizzled out. Or they, were, they started something and then they were forced to do it for the rest of their lives and they never want to do it anything. You know, they don't, and they, they, they're broken in that. That they, I don't want to start something because I'll never, I'll never be free from it. They have to have a starting and a finishing point so that they can try things, but also know what it means to be committed and follow through. And then every single one of these stages of development from conception all the way up to 12 years gets repeated from 13 to 18, 20 years old. So don't worry. It's, it's God's second chance for parents to get it right. It's a little harder, but you get to do it right this time. Okay, time. Haideți să încheiem această dimineață, ridicați în picioare, așteptând frumoasa cântare. Iisus, viața noastră, noi pe tine te mărim. Glorie, glorie, aleluia!
Doamne, Tată, ne închinăm în această dimineață înaintea Ta și îți mulțumim, Doamne, că ne-ai îngăduit să aruncăm o privire în modul în care ne-ai creat, Doamne, și să înțelegem atât de bine cuvintele psalmistului care înțelegea că ne-ai întocmit într-un chip tainic și minunat, Doamne. Îți mulțumim că ne-ai creat după chipul și asemânarea Ta, Doamne, că ai pus în fiecare dintre noi, Doamne, viața aceasta veșnică, gândul veșniciei, Doamne, cu care trăim până când vom ajunge în veșnicie. Îți mulțumim pentru biserica Ta, Doamne, îți mulțumim pentru trupul lui Hristos, Doamne, în care ne-ai născut pe fiecare dintre noi, Doamne, și te rugăm să ne înveți să umblăm în unitate, Doamne, în sfințenie, Doamne, ca să putem gusta din binecuvântările Tale cerești, Doamne, aici pe pământ și odată în veșnicii. Te rugăm să binecuvintezi lucrarea bisericii New Life, Doamne, te rugăm să binecuvintezi fiecare frate, fiecare soră, Doamne, tot ceea ce s-a pus în, în lucrarea Ta, Doamne, înmulțește, binecuvintează, Doamne, dă propășire Dumnezeul nostru. Ne rugăm pentru Shane și pentru Zac, Doamne, să-i binecuvintezi, Amin. să continui, Doamne, să le arăți lucrurile Tale minunate, Doamne, Ajută. să fie în stare, Doamne, să echipeze trupul Tău, trupul lui Hristos, Doamne, pentru vremurile care stau să vină. Și, Doamne, vrem să ne rugăm pentru fiecare tată și mamă prezentă în locul acesta, rugăm, pentru fiecare Doamne, părinte care este, care va fi să fie, Doamne. Să ne dai înțelepciunea Ta și Duhul Tău cel Sfânt, Doamne. Și o să ne ajut să ne creștem copiii în frica de Tine, Doamne, în teamă de Tine. Să învățăm calea Ta, Doamne, și să îi călăuzim spre veșnicie. Îți mulțumim încă o dată pentru dimineața aceasta și te binecuvântăm în numele Domnului Isus Hristos. Amin. Amin. Iar aceluia care poate să ne dea mult mai mult decât gândim sau cerem noi, singurului Dumnezeu adevărat, prin Isus Hristos și Duhul Sfânt, Dorim să-i fie adusă toată slava, cinstea Amen. și închinăciunea, acum și în ziua veșniciei. Amin. Amen. Cu harul Amen. Domnului, adunarea este liberă până după masă la ora șase. Și tine la Slăvit să fie Domnul.